Chapter 6, Cyberdyne Systems, 2001 Tricker took his time reading over Serena Burns' resume as she sat across the desk awaiting his attention. For someone her age, it was impressive, but then so was the lady herself. He'd already read it, of course. Not only read it, but investigated it. Assigning one or two underlings to go out and interview the exalted persons who had bestowed such glowing recommendations. Curiously enough, it seemed that very few people in those companies had ever interacted with Miss Burns in her capacity as head of security, assistant head of security, acting, associate, trainee, or any other job title in the corporate security name game. Except for the bosses, she was the incredible invisible woman, which must have been a tough stunt for an incredible, sexy, leggy, gorgeous blonde to pull off. He was rereading her resume now to see how she would react to being ignored. She was reacting by focusing her attention on him with such aggressive intensity that he felt in serious danger of reacting himself. He hadn't blushed since he was 20, but he felt one coming on now. So, he said finally, laying down the last page and raising his eyes to meet hers. Very impressive, Miss Burns. She looked amused, in a way that implied they shared a secret, possibly the fact that they both knew she was too good for Cyberdyne to pass up. I've been very fortunate in my employment, she said. I had excellent mentors, and her eyes went distant, as though she were remembering. We had some interesting times while I was with them. Uh-huh, Tricker thought. Now there's a statement that's open to interpretation. Well, oddly enough, not many people seem to remember you at your old jobs, he said. Serena elegantly shrugged one trim shoulder. I deliberately kept a very low profile. There are times when the obvious cop on the corner is a good idea, and others when it's not. Some corporate spies are incredibly clever. I find it's much easier to catch them if you've convinced them that you're not even around. She offered him a pleasant but impersonal smile. He hadn't reacted well to her so far. She wondered if that ignoring the interviewee while you read their CV ploy ever worked. And if it did, what good was it? As far as she was concerned, all they'd accomplished was to waste 20 minutes. The job was hers if she wanted it. He had to know that. If he turned her down, she would hit Cyberdyne with a very noisy discrimination suit, which she would almost certainly win something she was willing to bet Mr. Tricker knew. And she was also willing to bet that the last thing he or Cyberdyne wanted, now or ever, was noise in their vicinity. But she could be vastly more patient than this fellow could imagine. So she'd play his little game, answer his questions, fill out more forms, and take a battery of tests if required. She'd win in the end. Your career is remarkable, Tricker said, rubbing his chin. But your stay at each company was also remarkably short. Care to comment on that? No, she thought. This is where her apparent age was a problem. It had required her seemingly to hopscotch from one job to another in an alarmingly rapid manner. But there was no help for it. She was going to appear to be 25 for a very long time. So, looking 30, once there, she'd worry. For now, she had to get this position. I was acquiring my skills, she said, crossing her legs. Once a position had taught me all I thought it could, I moved on. He noticed her legs, as she'd meant him to. Very nice. This woman would be a cat among the pigeons here at Cyberdyne. Some of these computer geeks would sell their souls just to have coffee with her. And she'd implied that some of her upward mobility had come about from her horizontal agility. Problems like that he didn't need. What we're looking for here at Cyberdyne is someone who will be with us for the long haul, Tricker said, closing the folder on her application. I don't feel it's in our best interests to hire someone who might be lured away by the candy of a new experience. Serena was annoyed. Clearly, she'd misread this man, but everything so far had been so easy. That's no excuse for getting sloppy, she scolded herself. For once, a human had reacted to her sexually and yet kept that response separate from his reasoning faculty. She hadn't been here in the early years of the century for long, but she hadn't found that capacity to be common among men. But a job like this one is exactly what I've been honing my skills for, she said. 
An opportunity to establish a security system from the ground up is less common than you might think. I have a lot of ideas for Cyberdyne that I believe will keep it, its products, and its scientists safe and happy. Nothing like a happy product, Tricker said brightly. Serena grinned. Happy scientists, then? Or at least contented. These geniuses are very touchy and genuinely hate anything that might restrict them or smacks of Big Brother. But obviously, the company has to keep them safe from such threats as kidnapping. She paused significantly. Or murder. I think I've got a way to please everybody without rocking the boat. Yeah? Tricker thought cynically. Well, you may be super babe, but even you can't sleep with all of the people all of the time. Do tell, he invited. Serena shook her head. That wouldn't be in my best interests. Tricker nodded affably. Maybe not, he agreed. But it wouldn't be in our best interests to hire someone who might be gone in six months. Hire me, she said, leaning forward, her gaze locked on his. If I leave in under two years, I'll agree to pay you a kill fee, substantial enough to cover your search for a new applicant. If you decide to fire me after six months, you won't even have to pay me a severance check. I want this job, and I can make a difference here. Serena leaned back, still exuding a confidence she didn't quite feel. For some reason, this human had taken a dislike to her, and she couldn't think why, or exactly what to do about it. The obvious solution, killing him, might not be the best in this case. Though, his attitude did make it tempting. Tricker looked at her, taken aback. That was quite an offer she was ponying up. Still... We'll certainly take that into consideration, he said brightly, patting her file. He rose and offered her his hand. We'll be in touch, one way or the other. Serena shook his hand, taking brief pleasure in knowing she could crush it to a wet pulp. Thank you, Mr. Tricker. Just Tricker, he said. She nodded. I'll look forward to hearing from you. On that note, she picked up her briefcase and left without a backward glance. As Serena walked to the parking lot, she reran the interview, Tricker's image making a faint overlay on the scene around her. She was looking for the exact moment when she'd blown it. For blown it, she had. If he'd been undecided before meeting her, he was no longer. From this point on, he'd be actively opposed to hiring her. We had some interesting times while I was with them, the recording said, her voice sounding dreamy. His face remained impassive, but he blinked. That was the moment, she decided. That implication had worked very well with Colvin and Warren, but to Tricker, it had sent up a warning flag. She frowned. Failure loomed, and all over, an offhand remark made to the wrong person. Now, she could only hope that the president and CEO's support in her impulsive offer would sway him in her favor, for she felt with certainty that Tricker had the final say here. Perhaps I can think of some way to eliminate my rivals, she thought preferably in the form of better job offers rather than assassination. Things are so complicated here. I don't see how you can object to her, the CEO complained. Miss Burns is perfect for this job. Hey, Colvin, Tricker said, his eyebrows raised. What she is is a perfect 38, 24, 36, and a natural blonde, or I miss my guess. I was referring to her resume. Colvin said through his teeth. Sure you were, Roger, Tricker sneered. Is her body your only objection? Warren asked with a curl of his lip. Hey guys, Tricker leaned forward. Why don't we pretend our dicks are in the cafeteria, huddled over cups of coffee, and snickering about Miss Burns' assets, and let our brains take over this discussion? Have you two actually considered those glowing recommendations, or the scant time she put in to earn them? Doesn't it seem the least bit suspicious to you that only one or two people at these places seem to have even been aware of her existence? Warren and Colvin glanced at each other, then at Tricker. Well, don't you? Tricker's blue eyes fairly bulged with frustration. Are you trying to tell me that you'd forget working in the same building with that woman? No, Colvin said thoughtfully. Tricker? Warren folded his hands before him. You can't refuse to hire someone on the suspicion that she might have slept her way into a good recommendation. If you can't prove that, he spread his hands, it's irrelevant. And she has given us a very generous out if things go wrong. 
Colvin pointed out. Do you know how much damage someone in that position could do in a month? Tricker demanded. Do you know how much damage a discrimination lawsuit could do to this company? Warren countered. No one who applied has a better resume, Colvin pointed out, tapping the table with one finger. And no one else has offered us a virtual guarantee of satisfaction. I'll bet. Tricker's expression made it clear what he was thinking. Look, if you were going to pick the head of security no matter what we wanted, why did we even go through this charade? Warren asked. We have got other things to do, Tricker. Looking surprised by this onslaught, Tricker raised his hands in a reasoning gesture. Look, fellas, I'm just trying to point out some of the pitfalls of working with a possible bimbo. Or, worse yet, a possible plant from one of your competitors. I was trying to determine if you had at least considered that she might be more trouble than she's worth. I think a possible discrimination lawsuit would be even more trouble than it's worth, Colvin said. I agree, Warren said, especially since such a suit would seem to be justified in this case. Tricker slapped his hands onto the arms of his chair and just looked at them. He had to admit that they had him. He didn't like it, but knew for sure he was beating a dead horse. Unless he really did want to select their head of security himself. He considered it briefly. Nah, too much work. He would, however, keep a hawk's eye on Serena Burns. And, at the merest hint of misbehavior, he would demand her resignation. Don't say I didn't warn you, he said, rising. He turned at the door, pointing a finger. I'll be watching. There was silence for a full minute after he left. Grinning, Warren raised his hand and they high-fived like kids. That was a first, the president said. Felt good, Colvin agreed. Let's take the wives out to dinner. I feel like celebrating. Serena sat concealed in the upper branches of a cottonwood tree across the street from Roger Colvin's home. Given the distance between the houses in this neighborhood and the road, she was nearly a half mile away. She wore charcoal leggings and a matching hooded sweatshirt, black running shoes and gloves, and dark glasses. The only part of her that stood out was the pale skin of her forehead and cheeks. She'd been in position since 4 a.m., ignoring everything extraneous, including an incontinent pigeon. The computer part of her brain was able to translate the images her eyes saw, bringing them in closer for detailed scrutiny. Right now, she was watching Colvin's wife shepherd their young into the absurdly huge van that the well-off seemed to think essential for the most mundane chores. The boy, dressed in a blue uniform, yellow neckerchief, and yellow piped cap, was on his way to a scout meeting. The little girl in her pink coat and tights had a pediatrician's appointment. Or so Mrs. Colvin had told her husband as she stepped out the back door. Serena heard this from her post in the Cottonwood because she had high-powered microphones built into her DNA-augmented ears, feeding directly into the part of her natural brain that governed hearing. Training in some of the animal DNA in her genes gave her the ability to move the external part of her ear to catch sound still more efficiently. They should be gone for at least two hours, Mrs. Colvin had said. Assuming that woman can ever get them into the van, Serena thought, genuinely puzzled at how long it was taking. The boy had a toy in his hand that his mother apparently didn't want him to take with him. The child threw it on the ground with all his strength. A piece of it went flying. His mother picked up the toy and went to retrieve the part. Then she hunkered down in front of her son, seemingly in order to reason with him. Serena wasn't interested enough to listen. The child refused to look at his mother, his small face sullen. Everything Serena had studied about humans from this time period indicated that the young were especially annoying but the visible proof of it was still astounding. How did the species ever survive to this point? I'm amazed they don't eat their young at birth. Finally, after much to do and a chase around the van after the little girl, which ended when her brother punched her, though that began a whole new scene, they headed out. The security gate opened at Mrs. Colvin's electronic command and the van drove off. This had taken half an hour. Serena shook her head in amazement. Then she started down the tree and casually jogged down the street. There was a home nearby whose only security was a waist-high wall. It was owned by a man who apparently was unaware that the world was a dangerous place. She made for the side of the property where a neighbor had built a much higher wall and climbed over. Then she carefully proceeded across the yard. 
There didn't seem to be any security here other than the walls. She shook her head. At least the humans in her time knew they were vulnerable. Finally, she was in the Cyberdyne CEO's backyard, squatting under a Douglas fir and watching Colvin sipping coffee as he read the paper. She really wasn't sure how he would react. It was a 50-50 situation. He might be impressed at her audacity, or he could become too hysterical for effective communication. But she'd been able to find jobs for only two of her rivals, and the longer she waited, the more certain she became that she needed to act. So it was time to play her ace. The phone rang, and Colvin got up to answer it. Silently, Serena trotted over to the back door, picked the lock, slipped into the kitchen, and took his place at the table, hiding behind the newspaper as he talked on the kitchen phone. See you at two, then, Colvin said cheerfully. He hung up the phone and turned, and froze. There was a stranger reading his paper. Serena looked playfully around the newspaper and smiled at him. Good morning, Mr. Colvin. She snapped the paper closed. Everything in his body from his throat to his bladder seized. Then he felt nauseous. All he could think of was that Michael Douglas movie, Fatal Attraction. Thank God we don't own a bunny, he thought inanely. After a moment, he got his voice back. What, what the hell are you doing in my house? I needed to see you privately, Serena explained. For one thing, I wanted to demonstrate to you just how rotten your security system is. Not to mention your locks. I opened the door to the room you were in, and you didn't even know it. He blinked, then shut his mouth, letting anger take over. Are you even slightly aware of how creepy this is? He demanded. You're invading my home. You couldn't call my secretary and ask for an appointment? Serena reached into her pocket. She suppressed a smile as she watched Colvin react to the potential threat. Then she pulled out a disc in its plastic case and slowly laid it on the table. I'm living, she said, in a house with an interesting history. She pushed the disc toward him with her fingertips, watching him watch her. Then she licked her lips and smiled. It used to belong to Miles Dyson, a lovely place, but people are uncomfortable with its history. She shrugged, raising her eyebrows. So? I got it very cheap. The CEO looked from the disc to the woman and back again. Are you suggesting that came from Dyson's place? He asked. He didn't believe her. They'd searched thoroughly, and Dyson or his kidnappers had made a clean sweep of his work. Serena rose, tipping her chin upward and regarding him from half-closed eyes. The disc is a sample of what I've found, she smiled slyly. Look it over and then you tell me where it came from. She turned on her heels and walked to the door. You know where to find me when you want to talk. She left without a backward glance. Colvin stared at the closed door for a full minute, then experienced a full-body shudder that got him moving. In a few long strides, he was across the room and locking the door. Not that it would keep her out, obviously, but it seemed the appropriate thing to do. Wait a minute, wait a minute. She broke into your house? Warren's voice cracked with disbelief. He lowered the whiskey he'd been about to sip and stared. Yeah, I turned around and there she was. Never heard a thing. Even when she picked up the paper, it almost gave me a heart attack. Colvin poured himself a drink and swirled the amber liquid around in the heavy glass. He was finding it hard to look Warren in the eye for some reason, as if he were ashamed. Though, why he should be, he couldn't imagine. Christ. Cyberdyne's president said softly. He shuddered and wondered if she'd be paying him a visit later. At least she'd waited until Roger's wife and kids had left. He didn't like the idea of trying to explain Serena Burns to his own wife. This makes me much less inclined to hire her, he said aloud. If it had been just that, I would be too, Colvin agreed. He took a seat opposite Cyberdyne's president and a deep gulp of his own whiskey. They were in the CEO's home office and though it was before noon, Colvin had felt a need for a stiff drink. What do you mean? Warren asked nervously. She says she bought Mile Dyson's old home and found some material there pertaining to... Colvin waved his hand vaguely, but his eyes were intent. Warren leaned forward. The project? He gasped. The CEO nodded and took another sip of whiskey. But we looked. That's not possible. Paul Warren shook his head. Do you believe her? Let me show you what she gave me, Colvin said, rising. He brought over a laptop. I've taken out the modem, he explained. He turned it on, 
took a disc out of his shirt pocket and slipped it in. Read it and weep, he muttered. In less than a minute, Paul sat back, his hand over his mouth in horror. It's real, he whispered. He looked up at Roger. What did she say when she gave it to you? She said to look it over and then tell her where it came from. She said we knew where to find her when we wanted to talk. Is that all? Warren asked. Yep. Roger sat back in his chair and, closing his eyes, leaned his head against the cushions. The implication, of course, had been that if he didn't get back to her, someone else surely would. Should we tell Tricker? Warren asked. Colvin opened his eyes and considered the question. There didn't seem to be a right answer. If they didn't tell him, when he found out, and Tricker would find out, he might just yank the whole project from them and kick Cyberdyne off of government property. If they did tell him, he might go after Burns on his own, risking the loss of this tantalizing, promising material. Hire her, then tell him, Colvin decided. Once we've got that material safely in hand, I don't care what he does, but I don't want him going off half-cocked. Warren pursed his lips, then nodded slowly. You're right, of course. He took another sip of his whiskey. I don't see any alternative. Did she say what else she wanted, besides the job, that is? Roger shook his head, gazing into the middle distance. No, she didn't even mention the job, let alone any compensation for the use of this material. Well, it's our material, Paul snarled. Any court would uphold our claim to it. Colvin looked at him from under his eyebrows. Somehow I don't see Tricker going to the law under any circumstances, especially these. Warren opened his mouth as if to speak, then shut it again, looking thoughtful. He glanced at the CEO. He'll be furious. Tricker is always furious, Roger said. I think the fact that we exist infuriates him. I say what the hell, it's high time we gave him something to be really furious about. Cyberdyne's president chuckled at that. She said we knew where to find her, he said after a moment, but her application said she was in the process of moving. Yeah, in the Dyson's old house, Colvin said. Warren grimaced. That creeps me out. Roger covered his eyes with one weary hand. Then he sat forward and looked at his friend. I tell you one thing, though. I'm going to make it a point of honor never to invite that bitch to my home. Paul's eyes slid over to his boss. I don't want her in my home either, and we certainly can't meet with her in the office. Colvin nodded and suppressed a smile. Mrs. Warren was outrageously jealous. It forced poor Paul to behave suspiciously, even though he didn't even want to think about cheating on her. The sight of Serena Burns would drive the president's wife up the wall. Okay, we'll choose a bar at random, some place within 30 minutes of Dyson's place. I don't want to give this whiz kid a chance to bug the place or anything. We're going to be in enough trouble as it is. Okay, Warren said, rising. Where's the phone book? New York City, 2001. I've been waiting to see you all morning, Ronald LeBain shouted. The least you could do is give me the courtesy of a few minutes. The man he was bellowing at was a literary agent, a small, middle-aged man, neatly dressed. Since he was also a native New Yorker, the agent wasn't likely to be intimidated by mere yelling. What I'm going to give you is 10 seconds to get out of my office and not come back. Or do I have to call security? His glare and the quiet authority of his voice brought LeBain back to some semblance of rationality. I'm sorry, Ronald babbled. I, I didn't mean to raise my voice. My apologies. I'm really not usually like this. I'm just so frustrated. How many seconds is that now, Tildy? The agent asked his secretary. I said I was sorry. LeBain protested. He held up his hands in what was meant to be a calming gesture. Look, the publishers won't even look at my manuscript unless it comes from an agent, but I can't even get an appointment with an agent. It's driving me crazy. Couldn't you just look at my manuscript? The agent looked down. The stack of paper on the floor beside LeBain's feet was easily 18 inches tall. The text appeared to be single-spaced. It'll never sell, the agent said. You haven't even read it, Ronald said aghast. I don't have to. It's too long. The agent leaned over, read a few words. Nonfiction, right? Yes, LeBain drew himself up. I have a message. 
Hey, you got a message. Drop an email. If you can't say it any more succinctly than this, you haven't even got to pray it. This is about the size of the national budget, and I bet it's about as interesting. LeBain looked shocked. But it's a plan, too, he said softly. It's a message, it's a plan, the agent said. It's a candy, it's a breath mint. If you can't cut it down from this, it's unsellable, is what it is. Closing his eyes, Ronald took a deep breath and let it out slowly. His shoulders drooped with exhaustion and discouragement. The agent tightened his lips. This guy looked like he was going to cry. But he wouldn't be the first author who'd broken down in his office. Publishing was a puppy-kicking business. Look, he said, make up your mind which is more important, the message or the plan. You don't have to put them both in one book, you know? About your plan, it may help to think. God got it down to just ten commandments, and humanity still has a hell of a lot of trouble with them. So keep it simple. Oh, and it's double-spaced, one-sided, or they won't even look at it. And that's all the help you'll get from me. Now get out of my office and don't come back. Thank you, LeBain said as he struggled to gather up his manuscript. Thanks, really. The agent pointed to the door, and Ronald struggled through it. When he was gone, the agent leaned against his secretary's desk. You're a softie, she said affectionately. He folded his arms and smiled. I just can't shoot down a guy's dreams when he's right in front of me. I think that makes me more of a coward than a softie. After a moment, she said, You're waiting for him to disappear, aren't you? The agent rolled his eyes. You think I want to ride down in the elevator with him? I'm afraid he'll kidnap me. Ronald hoisted his manuscript onto the van's passenger seat with a grunt and ignored the beeping and honking from the crowded street. He was angry, with the system and with himself. He'd made a complete fool of himself in front of the agent. He'd done everything but break down and cry. But he was exhausted and hungry, which always made him prone to being emotional. Ron slept in the van for the most part. The exorbitant parking fee was still infinitely cheaper than a hotel room. Every few days, he treated himself to a night at the Y so he could have a shower. Not that keeping moderately clean seemed to be helping. He could feel himself slowly melting into the kind of troglodyte you sometimes saw scurrying off the end of a subway platform. LeBain leaned his arms and head onto his manuscript and sighed. Nothing in New York had happened the way he'd hoped. With a grunt, he sat up and thought that it was time to take stock. At least the commune hadn't had him arrested for stealing the van. He'd spent more than a few happy moments while he drove cross-country imagining how the conversation must have gone around the dinner table when he didn't come back from town. But it didn't matter what they thought or felt. He'd been lucky they hadn't charged him with theft, yet. And the decrepit van had performed beautifully in the sunnier climates he'd driven through on his way here. LeBain took it as an omen. He was finally heading in the right direction. Now, he had to find some way to make people want to look at his book, and more immediately, a way to support himself. He'd allowed himself to draw only $3,000 from the commune's account. They'd be a lot less complacent about that, he suspected. But he was quickly running through his money, even living on fast food. So he had to get a job of some sort. Wait a minute. Hadn't someone on the net mentioned an ecology expo in New York happening about now? Hey, I could give talks about my plan, he thought. Maybe not at this one, but he knew there were expos at New Age conventions all over the country, all of the time. They would have information, and he could make contacts. It would mean catering to the sellouts for a while, but it could be quite profitable. And the sad truth was, you couldn't accomplish anything without cash and a lot of it. Meanwhile, he could revise his work until it became publishable. Bowed but not broken, he thought, I'll find a way. I'm the president, and this gentleman is the CEO of Cyberdyne, Warren explained for the third time to the MP, this time a little more slowly. We want to get into our offices to do some work on secured computers. Our home offices aren't secure. He was beginning to wonder if the young man staring into his window was impaired in some way when he finally waved them through. What do you suppose that was all about? Colvin asked out the side of his mouth. Who the hell knows? Paul muttered as he steered himself into his reserved space near the entry. 
Typical beef brain soldier, probably. Serena, miles away, listened to their complaints via the bug she'd planted in their car and smiled. More likely, he was letting Tricker know that you were there, she thought. She'd have left orders to that effect. Any unusual activity to be reported. No entry without personal approval. She was finding it frustratingly difficult to learn anything about the mysterious government liaison. So, she'd begun attributing to him powers and abilities that he might not even have. Better to overestimate an enemy's abilities than to be caught unprepared. Tricker unnerved her. But these two? When she gave them the disc, they were like kids. Human kids, that is. Undisciplined and utterly transparent. She'd been able to see that they thought that they were clever. But she wasn't absolutely sure whether they thought they were outsmarting her or Tricker. She'd watch them arrive at the bar of their choice, listen to them argue in the car about whether one of them should go in while another one waited outside for her arrival, heard them decide it really made no difference, and watch them go in together. Well, it really didn't make any difference, except that it made it easier for her to plant the bug in Warren's car. What she was really looking forward to was the moment when they put that disc into their computers. It would give her full access to Cyberdyne's computers and she would finally be able to check their progress on Skynet. She would also be able to hear any conversations that took place in front of those computers. That way, if she failed to get the job, she'd still be able to influence events to some extent. I really hope I haven't overplayed my hand, she thought. It had been obvious that the humans were both angry and frightened, and while their attempts to hide their true feelings were amusing, they were also worrisome. Serena wondered how she should handle the situation. Seduction, perhaps? She hadn't wanted to go that route since she realized that the two men were friends. It would be bad for the Skynet project to have them at each other's throats in a fog of jealousy. Serena tapped the steering wheel with her fingernails, thinking. Apology, she decided. A simple, upfront, embarrassed apology might work. If she did it right, they'd end up charmed instead of appalled, which they both seemed to be now. She closed her eyes and forgot about her surroundings for a moment as her computer systems began to receive a flood of information from Cyberdyne. Opening her eyes in satisfaction, she listened to the real-time conversation between the president and CEO. That's impossible, Warren was saying. Not necessarily, Colvin answered, his voice thoughtful, as though he was still reading. This is Dyson's work we're talking about here. That guy was amazing. Not many people can make me feel like I'm falling behind, but Miles most always did. A fully automated computer-controlled munitions factory? Paul said. Come on, Roger, that doesn't even sound safe, let alone possible. There was a long silence. Then? We need to see the rest of this, the CEO said. The government will love it. What if there isn't any more? Warren asked. I'm afraid we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. But this is Dyson's work, Paul. It has to be. And if there's more of it, then it will probably move our work forward by up to six months. I say we go for it. We still don't know what she wants, Warren protested. Let's not jump into bed with the bitch until we've got that tacked down. That breaking into your house number was a little too psychotic for my peace of mind. Colvin laughed. I'm not sure I'd be any more comfortable after telling her she wasn't going to get the job. There was silence again except for the clicking of keys. Tell Tricker. Warren said. Let him sort it out. One of them inhaled deeply, then exhaled sharply. After a moment, Roger said thoughtfully, I'm not sure I want to go that far. What? Warren's voice squeaked with surprise. It was your house that was broken into. If she's going to be trouble, that would imply it's you she'd go after. I say neutralize her, now, when she's not expecting it. Okay, let's just look at this calmly for a minute, the CEO said. She's young much younger than the other candidates. Maybe she just got carried away. Boy, I'll say, Paul sneered. I'll find myself wondering how I would be reacting to this if it had been, say, Bob Cho. Cho was another candidate for the security chief position. He was 45, about 5'8", slender, but very fit. He'd gotten his start in the CIA. Yeah, Warren said slowly. I guess I see what you mean. But would he do something like that? If he had an ace like this to play, yes, I think he might. And if she'd called up and asked for a private meeting, would you have given her one? Warren laughed at that sharply, but just once. Hell no. Me neither, 
all because she's an attractive young blonde. So what I ask myself is, what choice did she have, really? There was another long pause. Okay, Warren said reluctantly. You've made a good enough case that I'm willing to hold off sicking tricker on her until after she's hired. I mean, sooner or later, we're going to have to come clean about where this new stuff came from, right? Why don't we seek out the advice of our new security director on that one, Colvin answered. Yes, Serena thought. Ah, the wonderful ability of the human brain to find reasons not to be frightened. How useful it was. She put her car in gear and drove off. Time to go home and process the information she'd gathered. Would tomorrow be too soon to apologize, or should she wait until she'd been working with them a few days? She could attribute the delay to embarrassment. They would probably find that rather appropriate. She pushed in a CD titled Hits of the 80s, purchased so that she could become familiar with the popular culture of her supposed childhood. Few of the songs made sense, but that was humans for you. Most of these sounds tickled the pleasure center of the brain to a slight degree, which was undoubtedly the point. So, like a human, she decided to just sit back, relax, and let the sensation roll over her. Soon, she would move into phase two. Ecology Expo, New York, 2001. This is boring, Peter Ziedman said. He frowned and shifted the heavy camera on his shoulder. No kidding, his sound man and college bud Tony Roth agreed. It's nothing like what I expected. They glared at the neatly set up booths and the casually well-dressed people around them. Even the loopier outfits had cost real money. You could see that. They'd been expecting a lot more over-the-rainbow stuff from the New York Ecology Fair. Ziedman had been pinning his hopes on it, in fact. He'd graduated from Chapman University only two months ago, with honors, and already his dad was asking, so what did I spend my money for? Like you could get a full-fledged movie together over the weekend. Well, okay, some people had done that, but not lately, and probably not while sober. So, Peter had decided to do a documentary on an inspired madman. They'd find their guy at a place like this, and then follow him around while he tried to convert the world. It would be hilarious. But what he'd found instead was a slew of startup businesses looking for venture capitalists. And while he knew there was a story worth telling in that, at the moment he needed something fast, easy, and moderately entertaining from the first shot. The story of water purification devices just wasn't going to do that. Where are the nuts? He shouted. A young woman beside a solar energy display turned to look at him. The Rainforest Products booth is giving away Brazil nuts in aisle four. She pointed vaguely in that direction. Ziedman looked at her. She was attractive in a washed out, waspy kind of way. He walked over to her and said, I'm making a documentary and I was hoping for some colorful characters to spice up the narrative. He shrugged and then shifted the camera. It can't be all facts and figures. She nodded, looking vaguely disapproving. That was when he noticed that her badge said she was the fair's co-chair. So, what exactly are you looking for? She asked. Peter thought he was probably very lucky that she wasn't asking him to leave, as he hadn't received permission from the fair to film here. She looked capable of kicking him out. He decided to be honest. I'm looking for someone with a message, he said. Someone who can't get anyone to listen, but who thinks he or she can save the world. You know anybody like that? She laughed, and it changed her whole face. She really was attractive. Oh, yes, she said. I know tons of people like that, but they tend to avoid places like this. To them, we're all sellouts. She looked around and seemed to spot someone. Pointing to a tired-looking man on a folding chair near the door, she said, Try him. That's Ron LeBain. He used to be a pretty good guy, associated with a small, fairly successful organic farm in Washington State. She shook her head. Now it's kind of sad, really. He's got a book he's trying to get published. He's kind of into a lone wolf thing right now. Ziedman looked at the man. He was wearing tan chinos and a sport jacket over a sweater vest and an open-collared blue shirt. Though he was clean-shaven and his hair was neat, there was something a little shop-worn about him. His whole body spoke of discouragement and exhaustion. Peter turned on the camera and zoomed in on him, as if by instinct, like the lone wolf the woman had named him, 
Labane turned to look directly into the lens. He raised one brow and with a lopsided smile, raised his hand and gestured Peter over. Thanks, Ziedman said to the woman. He and Tony hustled over, 